Thank you, and uh, thanks everyone for joining us this afternoon for uh, the webinar, Accelerate Your BPM Investment with Business Rules. Uh, the, the folks on the uh, webinar talking are going to be myself, uh, obviously uh, I'm Chief Marketing Officer at Corticon, and Dave Reed, who is uh, Chief Technology Officer at, at Blue Slate. So uh, here, here's the agenda. Uh, we'll talk through process automation, uh, varying ways to automate that, the implica implications from a services perspective and a rules perspective, uh, and then we'll have some time at the end for Q&A. So with that, let, let me kick it off. So, uh, you know, all, all business processes start out at a manual level. And it's clearly manual processes are highly inefficient, they can be very frustrating, and they can be very costly. So there are various steps that you can choose to improve that. First one is to automate the process, and that can be done through business process management, BPM. The, the next step, you can actually automate the processing, automate the decisions that drive those processes and the way you make those decisions. And that's where Corticon comes in, and, and, and we'll talk more on that as we go through it. But, but the net is, by doing this, by moving down that cycle of automating the process and automating your processing, you are increasing your cost savings dramatically, and you're able to make better and faster decisions. So let's talk about what, what automating a business rule means. So in, in business, you're, you're obviously trying to make decisions. And uh, an example here on the left is, if you're a financial services organization, should credit be extended to this customer? And there are a variety of rules that underlie that decision. One being, hey, you don't provide credit to guys who aren't paying their bills. So uh, being able to automate that decision allows you to move faster, getting those decisions in seconds as opposed to minutes or, or hours. Uh, you can cut your losses, and obviously customers are happier on the, on the back side. Uh, in an insurance example, uh, adjudicating a claim, uh, the rule underlying that could be reject the claim with an invalid billing code. So that's a pretty simple thing to do. You don't need a person involved in making that decision. You, you can set that up to be automated. And clearly, if you can automate that, you accelerate the, the response time, you can reduce your losses, and, uh, and again, uh, keep customers happier. So here's an actual real-world example from one of our customers, uh, an insurance company in claims handling. Uh, when, when they started, they had a process for how to do these, these claims, and it was 26 manual steps. So there was a person involved in each one of these 26 steps. By implementing a BPN system and business rules, they were able to dramatically reduce that. And on the right, what you see is those 26 steps have now become 19 automated ones and only seven manual steps. Now, clearly you, uh, you don't want to automate everything. Uh, when time comes to cut a check, you'd ideally like to have a person involved in that decision. But the, the, there are so many other places in there where you just don't need that manual intervention. Uh, you, can, you can automate those processes and automate the rules underlying them so that you're making the best practices decision every time. It's not even up to the whims of the people in that. It's Given this set of input, this is a decision we want out the end, and you're making that every single time. So Corticon, a uh, quick overview, and, and we'll get to this more later, but I, we allow you, along with BPM, uh, to accelerate your investment by automating the rules. You get better, faster decisions, not only by automating manual processes, but also by transforming your legacy systems that are often really hard to change. Uh, we do that through our patented no-coding engine. Uh, it reduces your development and chain cycles. And uh, I think best of all, by setting it up, uh, when you automate it, it's back to that concept of you're making the best decision, the best practices decision every time. And it's not up to the whim of a person on a good day or a bad day making a decision one way or another. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Dave to talk through uh, exactly how you, how you get started in automating the, the, the process side of things. And then we'll come back to how, how the rules play in a little bit. So Dave, the, the, the floor is yours. Great, and I just need to get my screen up. It's coming over. We're perfect. Okay, so thank you very much, Bob, and welcome everyone. So I'm going to be talking a bit about these uh, this type of environment and how you can use it to uh, automate your operations. And as Bob started off uh, discussing, processes uh, start off in a manual. Uh, mode, and businesses tend to operate that way. And so, what we see as we go out uh, looking at different enterprise shops 
is that they'll have this kind of classic mode of operation. And you probably recognize a lot of these, but their systems will be somewhat stovepipe. They won't share a lot of data between them. Their communication style will be rather ad hoc, a lot of emails being passed around, a lot of um, pull requests from individuals looking for information, nothing being delivered in a timely fashion in an automated way. And what you're really trying to do as you start to leverage these uh, tools like Corticon is to optimize that and automate things so that information is delivered as you need it, so that systems can see the information that they need in real time um, instead of having to have someone either rekey it or, or look it up. This is an example from a project uh, that we were on with a client, and this was just looking at the current state of their systems. And the, these individual systems each had an important role to play in the business, and they'd been developed over time by different departments. And the color coding was used uh, by us to indicate the different technologies that were in use and the types of data that were stored and whether there were workflow and rules embedded within them. And really what's interesting about this is it shows just the number of applications that were being created and the redundancy uh, between them in terms of business rules and the data content and such. And so there's a lot of inefficiency that's been built into that uh, and a lot of, um, a lot of lost uh, effort and energy. What happens in an environment like that is that that redundancy of data and that redundancy of rules leads to a lot of fragility in these different applications because a change in one, uh, changing a business rule, let's say, doesn't reflect the same change in another system. And so we get different behaviors out of these applications. And that becomes very problematic over time uh, and certainly means that our business systems aren't aligning themselves to the strategic operation of the business uh, because clearly the business has a given direction, not the five different directions of the different systems. This is another example of what we tend to see uh, in an environment that's thinking about using um, these types of automated tools. This is a spreadsheet that a department was using to actually understand when different tasks were supposed to take place. And so into the spreadsheet, they would put dates that said what process was supposed to occur. And then they had to go look at this essentially on a daily basis and see, is today the day I'm supposed to carry out this activity? Clearly an inefficient uh, process and something that would definitely lend itself to automation. So one of the things that we tend to hear a lot about is service-oriented service, uh, service architecture, some way of actually dealing with um, the connection of tools. And that is a key part of leveraging something like uh, Corticon in your environment. The idea is that we can integrate a tool uh, and pass information using services or messaging uh, in a way that we now don't have to write a lot of code at a low level to pass the data around. And so the traditional goals of, of service-oriented architectures are this flexibility and agility that we hear about. But principally, what we're interested in are the tools themselves. So these components and what they do. And what's important is that the tools have a purpose and that we use them consistently in that manner so we don't end up with stovepiped uh, collections of business rules or stovepipe collections of processes. And uh, a lot of times you'll hear this referred to as dry or don't repeat yourself. The idea being that if you have a business rule or a piece of data, it should exist in exactly one place and everyone should just refer to it. And another term that we tend to use is that the systems are orthogonal. In other words, they have their purpose, and that purpose is different than the other systems. And the goal that we're trying to achieve is to move towards an architecture like this um, generalized one. The vision being that the individual components, which are down at the bottom, things like our rule engines and our workflow engines, serve that purpose of housing our rules and housing our workflows. And that the applications, which are near the top of this chart in that application tier, well, they're just collections of rules and workflows that then integrate with the different data sources and such. But they don't represent the individual rules. Those rules come from a single system of record. Uh, the other beauty of that is that, that the front end doesn't, isn't tied in any way to the behavior of that application. And I'll come back to that in a moment. Now, a major part of this is that the data itself is unified and that there's exactly one place to go look for a given piece of information regardless of what system wants to access that data. And we refer to this as having common shared data, but also that it's canonical in form, meaning that we can always recognize its structure and how it's defined. 
and that then I'll makes it much simpler to integrate with. And a term that you'll hear used a lot for this is master data management, and that is a, a focus that a business has to have if they're going to really leverage um, these types of tools uh, and get a lot of uh, benefit out of them. Now, as I mentioned a moment ago, a big advantage of this is then the front end is no longer tied to the application itself, but rather the application being really made up of the different rules and workflows can be expressed in different ways. And so the front end, which might be uh, my web browser, or it might be a smartphone, it could be a person calling into my call center, and it's the call center rep is representing the application. But I'll always get a consistent answer, and my processes will always execute in the same way. So I don't end up with different answers or different inputs, uh, different exceptions occurring within my processes, because they're really unified by this, um, this set of services. Now this can sound overwhelming because it sounds like a lot of work, and it is a fair amount of work to get from some current state that's not leveraging an environment like this to a, comp a nice, pretty, service-oriented architecture uh, with business rule systems, et cetera. But what's really nice about leveraging uh, this type of approach is that it lends itself to being done in an agile fashion. In other words, you can do this iteratively because the whole intent is to integrate with different uh, services and different um, components. And so I can add components and services one at a time into a target architecture and move myself there through iterations. And that is a really powerful approach to leveraging this because I'm not trying to solve all my problems at once. Instead, I look for what's, where am I gonna get the biggest bang in improvement and I attack that and then I can go after um, the next project that has the next set of returns. And that really works well, and we see a lot of businesses benefiting from that approach. So looking specifically at the processes and rules, one of the things that's important to understand is that processes and business rules are two very different things. Uh, and as is outlined in this slide, it, they, they really exist for different purposes and kind of over different time or lifetimes, if you will, as they execute. And what's important to come away with is an understanding that the approach to document uh, and configure a process is very different than the process that you would, or the, the way that you would represent a set of business rules. And the reason for that is really what's built out in that table up on the slide. And that is that rules themselves tend to be stateless. We tend to want to send information and get an answer back. Whereas a process lives for a long period of time. It may live for days, it may live for weeks. And it has to maintain that information and in some ways persist that information over that long period. And we have to, because of that fact, we have to think of them differently. They execute in different environments and they look very different. And so we're gonna actually uh, drill into why that's the case. So this is an example of a business process that actually has some business rules in it. And what we can see is there are really two um, outcomes possible in this process. I either assign work to an underwriter or I pay a claim. But I can see that there are some decisions that have to be made, and that really represents one or more business rules. And what's difficult to understand by looking at this process is what is the business rule? Instead, what I see is some relatively low-level logic that almost looks the way it would look if I had coded this in a programming language. Uh, and this clearly does not lend itself to being maintained easily. It also doesn't lend itself to have the rules maintained separately from the process, and yet the two really are fairly independent. So if we take a look at how we might approach resolving this, the first thing that um, people will sometimes do is they'll break out the rule and they'll say, okay, I'm gonna take this rule and I'm gonna express it in the um, business rules um, tool or some kind of component. And then I'll make a, a service call out to that. And so in my process, I will make a call out to the rules environment, and I'll let the rules environment um, figure out what's the answer um, at this decision point, and then I'll get that answer back. The, the issue with this is it really isn't terribly scalable because I have all these decisions in my business process, and it would represent making a call out to some rules environment for every one of these decisions. And those calls are being directed by the uh, process but they really aren't part of the process. 
the process itself just cares about am I assigning this to an underwriter or am I going to pay the claim? It's the business rules that have to decide which of those outcomes are appropriate, and the logic to get there does not belong in the process itself. So we really need to rethink the way that, that these, these environments get leveraged. And so if we consider that the process and the rules really are each a first-class citizen, then the process simply becomes a decision about whether I'm going to send this to an underwriter or pay the claim, and then a set of rules that represent how to make that decision. And the two then exist rather independently, and there's only really one touch point, and that is when the decision needs to be made, the rules environment can be asked for the decision. But now the rules can be maintained um, completely in parallel uh, and independently of making any changes to the process itself. And so this really is an effective way to leverage these types of environments. The other advantage to breaking rules out in this fashion is that rules actually are used by more than just business processes. The rules are used in reporting, our user interfaces, and our third-party applications when they need to understand what is an answer to a question. What does something mean? Or what is the result of a calculation? These are all business rules, and they result in information that I may want to display, not just make a decision about. And what that really means is that the rules are giving me a context or meaning for my data. And so that's really that's the last thing I want to talk about is that the advantage of breaking out rules into services is it allows me to then leverage that meaning across my applications. So let, let me kind of drill into what I mean by that. If you look at this uh, slide, it's got a lot of data on it, but that data really isn't actionable because I don't understand what it means. If I try to give it some context, then I start to understand what it is. But I still don't clearly know what it means. In other words, I don't know what action to take just because the net sales increase year over year was 18%. But at least I know what it is. But the fact is that the, what I really need is to understand what it means and what I'm supposed to do with it. And so if we take away from that that I, when I access data, I go through a business rule tier, then what that means is that I can change my mind over time. The business can change their mind about what something means and what they're supposed to do in response to it without having to redefine the information or redefine the applications that are using it. So let me walk you through an example of that where we're going to look at two pieces of data that actually look very different, but in a business context may end up meaning the same thing, or at least uh, take on each other's meaning over time. And so I have the number three, and then I have this date of um, July 22nd, 2011. The form is different, but the business may use these in the same way. So let me show you how that can happen. So I have three individuals who work at three separate companies. And these companies do business with each other, and they share some uh, information. And company number three here actually has an extranet, and they share some information with their partners, but they have some applications on their extranet site that are only accessible to their employees. And so each of those applications has a rule built into it that says if the user coming in works for company number three, then you can let them through. And so if a user attempts to log in from company three, they'll get through. And if a user attempts to log in from some other company, they won't. Well, that's all fine and, and well until the company decides that they want to start opening these services up to their partners. So if the company then makes a change and says instead they're going to grant access and they're going to set up an access date, and it's the date that's going to decide whether or not someone's allowed into these applications. Well, I have a disconnect because the business now wants to be able to define partner access, but the applications themselves are still looking for this uh, employee uh, working for the company. So now I need to modify the applications to take in and interpret this date as granting permission. So I'm going to do all that maintenance, and now once that's done, I'll be able to actually access the system as intended. But that's a fair amount of work for something that really seemed like it should have been a trivial change. And the issue is that we shouldn't be integrating our applications directly with data. We should be integrating our applications with rule-based repositories that can interpret the data and supply the meaning. And so if we look at this uh, example where we focus on the meaning, what, what the business really wants is to have the application ask whether or not the person is allowed access. The definition of access being allowed is up to the business and can change over time. So in this case, the business rules environment would be told, here's how you determine whether access is allowed. And so when a user comes in, 
it'll check with the rules engine and then whatever the rule is, however the business has defined it, it can figure out whether the uh, individual has um, access to that resource. So that's just a, a simple example of how business rules and rule services aren't just about business processes, they're really about the underlying meaning uh, of, the, of the data itself. And I think that's a fundamental strength of using these environments. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to Bob so he can explore some more about the, um, the internals, really, of the Corticon product. Great. Thank you, Dave. So let me spend just a couple minutes here to, uh, digging a little deeper into business rules and, and how that works to automate them. So uh, the, the, so the, uh, oh, one second. I gotta make sure I'm sharing my desktop. Okay. So, so the, the the general problem that organizations have when they automate business rules is that the traditional way to do that is programming. And you know you have guys write code, and yeah, you can take simple rules, and you can do it. Uh, more complex ones can be difficult, if not impossible. And any single change, like, like the example Dave was given a minute ago, can be really difficult to do, and in many cases can impact hundreds of other rules and processes. And change is going to happen. I mean, a variety of, of factors can cause that, from you know regulations to policy changes to competition to market changes, all that. And, and the general reaction when you when you bring that forward to a CIO is, ooh, we could do that. Uh, that change is going to take several years, several million dollars. Clearly, there's a better way. And that better way is a rules engine underlying that. So what Corticon has is uh, we've got a rules engine. And the way it works is on the left side here, you have your business analysts, business policymakers, and, and IT folks. And what they can do with a rule engine is to model those rules. You model them. You test them. You make sure they result in the decision that you want. Once you have that, you crank them through the Corticon engine, and what comes out are these executables. They can run in either Java or .NET, uh, what we call them decision services. And it's really based on this set of rules. That's the decision you get out of that, and it can fit into your, your SOA architecture as necessary. You can also go back and easily change them. So it, it's easy to analyze what you've done and to make changes to those rules. This is what the Corticon rules development environment looks like. It's very Excel-like, very spreadsheet-like. Uh, you know, we say it's out of the box for business analysts and IT professionals. I'd say it's not something you're going to learn in 15, 20 minutes, but certainly over a few hours a day, you can become an expert at this and know how to model the rules. And what you've got here is, you know, a template with specific business vocabulary, library functions, rule statements in that lower right, and rules in the top. So the, the beauty here is all of your rules are written in English. It's not like they're deep in the code. You can go back six months later, a year later, a week later, and say, oh, that's the rule. I need to change it. I can see that. You can see the ramifications of making that change. Uh, you know, let's say you make a change. We, we have a test function in, in Corticon that pops up a screen that shows you, oh, because you made that change, you now have a conflict with this rule or you have an incompleteness of that decision. So, so by the time you leave this modeling environment, you have – a, a guarantee that that is the, the decision I wanted out of that set of rules is what I'm getting. And this is not just for simple problems. This is, you know, we've proven this with customers with the most complex and sophisticated business problems out there. So what does that mean from a, what, what's the impact of that on your development organization? Well, on the top there, you've got the, you know, traditional approach of the business guys would specify what they want to have done, kick it over to IT, Programmers, they design it, they code it, they test it. All that gets collapsed down with Corticon and, and with the rules engine into that modeling phase. So, you know, we have customers who have cut their development and change cycles by 90%. That, that's, that's an amazing number when you look at the amount of time and effort it takes to, to implement these kinds of projects and change them. And then this one speaks well to the integrity, the rule integrity issue I was talking before of knowing that you've got the right decision coming out the back end. This is a classic development cycle, you know, requirements, design, coding, test, production. Well, the reality is most errors that happen in 
designing or, or automating a process happen back at the requirements phase. But the problem is you don't, you don't pick it up until you've actually gone to production or, or gone out to testing, in unit testing. And that's incredibly more costly than if you knew about it up front. It's catastrophically costly if you actually go to production and discover a mistake uh, when you could have found that back at the beginning. So what, what Corticon does, as I've indicated, is in that modeling environment, you're making all those, all those uh, you're automating the rules, you're making all those decisions guaranteed up front in the process. And then, you know, rule engines all need to uh, perform. Uh, this is my one somewhat uh, technical slide here, I, I, and I'm not going to go into great detail, but in the business rule space, the traditional algorithm that does the processing is called Reedy. It scales really well with number of rules, uh, but uh, if the complexity of the data, if, if, if you're having to really uh, process a lot of data, it becomes really cumbersome, and you hit what's known as the Reedy wall, and it's a well-known thing in the, in the business rule space. Well, Corticon took a totally different approach. We have our DDR design time algorithm, and it just scales linearly. So there's, there's no impact uh, depending on either the size of the number of rules or the complexity of the rules. Uh, example, just we've, we've got proven success here over 450 customers across a number of verticals. Uh, some, of the, some of the newest ones we've been uh, experiencing success with are in e-commerce. Uh, eBay is a great example. Uh, they selected us earlier this year to be the rule engine underlying their next generation marketplace to figure out <clears throat> uh, between customer, uh, between buyers and sellers that whole trusted relationship, who should get paid when, uh, who should we hold it on, who do we trust, et cetera. But, you know, the, the applications for business rules are pretty universal. Any organization has processes and has rules in there that, that they can automate to improve that process. Uh, we're, the analysts have all uh, looked at Corticon and, and said great things about us. I won't spend a lot of time here. You can find out more information on this uh, by, by coming to our website. So in, in summary, on, on, the, uh, on the business rule side, you can accelerate your BPM investment. If you're starting with a manual process, obviously you can make huge strides by implementing a BPM <clears throat> system, and you can then uh, accelerate that by automating the rules within that. And uh, as I indicated earlier, it's all about making better, faster decisions, getting that, that best practices decision every single time in, in that process. And the, the, the beauty of the Corticon approach is it really is a no-coding approach. This is not a, a long development cycle. It's, it's a collaboration between IT and business analysts to really get to those, get to those decisions. So with that, uh, we're going to uh, open it up to some, some questions and answers. Uh, we, we've had a few come in while we've been going. If you have other questions during the time, uh, at, during this session, please, please uh send those in and we'll try and get to them. So first question is, do we have an example of a joint customer success between Blue Slate and Corticon? And uh, Dave, do you want to take that one? I'll, I'll kick that one to you. To Sure. And uh, absolutely we do. Uh, we've uh, been excited to be uh, working with Corticon um, at uh, company Vermont Mutual in the insurance space. And uh, we actually worked with Vermont Mutual uh, to go through a process of looking for uh, a tool that would serve them well. Uh, and they vetted uh, several and um, ended up choosing uh, Corticon and uh, we're actually in the middle of uh, working through uh, their first project uh, in production fashion with that. So it's all very exciting um, and it's been a great collaboration I think between us. The one thing I'd add to that is in, in most of the implementations that we're in, <clears throat> it's that, that first project is just the tip of the iceberg. You know, you, you get in there and it, once, once, once teams see how this works and how it really drives efficiencies and cost savings and, 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 and better, better business decisions in the, in, in the whole process, uh, there are various other places that organizations begin to look and go, oh, if I can automate over here, let me implement a process over here. Let me let me automate business rules over here. So, uh, another question: uh, How would you suggest that a company get started in choosing and integrating these technologies, BPM and and business rules? Uh, Dave, again, I'm gonna. You want you want to take a cut at that one? 
and I'll throw it. Sure. In the um, and I don't know if there's a way I can show my uh, desktop because I actually have a slide that can speak to that. Yes, David, you can show it now. Actually. Oh, that'd be great. If you share your slides. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so yeah, and that's actually a, an excellent question because it could seem overwhelming to figure out with all the the, the tool choices and the work that that sometimes needs to be done even to integrate them, uh, what's the best way to go about it? And what we found is really taking a step back and looking at the overall business strategy and business goals, and then looking at the current capabilities that, that a company has in their IT group. You can then create a vision and really an iterative plan. Like I said earlier, this is a journey, and there are steps that you can go through. And so what we've done is working with, with customers, we've looked at where are they, where are they trying to go, what what can we leverage, and then what are the missing components? And frequently, um, a way to represent rules and interact with those rules in an, in an automated fashion is missing from the stack. There are a lot of one-off applications, but rarely is there a, a good repository for the rules. And so we'll put this roadmap together. And really, these are the major pieces that we're looking at. We've We've got some target, which is based on the business strategy, but there are things the business is trying to do. We have an infrastructure and capabilities that are being leveraged, and then we have um, gaps that need to be mitigated, and we can put plans together around that. And those plans fit really into two types. They're either what we call quick wins, which are tactical in nature, and um, deal with uh, things that are short-term pain points, but that we can hopefully um, mitigate quickly. And then what we call transformational projects, which are going to be the more strategic changes, the integrations of major components or major processes uh, and replacing um, legacy applications, those types of projects, transformational in nature. The beauty of this is that you can look at it and look at you have a plan that's actionable and a plan that is very focused on achieving what your business is trying to do. And then finally, it's, it's measurable. Uh, there we look at what is the ROI of actually taking this approach and what's the benefit. So, yeah, it, it's definitely a journey, and you want to think up front and plan it out before you take your first steps. Great. Thank you. Um, another question that, that came in is, can you expand upon the difference between a process workflow engine and a, a rules engine and rules environment? Uh, you know, I think I would uh, – let me start off with that one, Dave. It's it's kind of as you said during your piece of the presentation, processes are longer running things. They're 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 take the claims example. It's how you take that claim from point A to point D to E to F to Z. The the rules piece of it is very much at that point in time at, at a point in time in that process. Is there a decision that needs to be made, and do you have the right inputs to make that decision without a person being involved in it? And those may change. I mean, as, as policies change, as regulations change, as business conditions change, you may want to adjust that rule, and you can easily do that. But that's what's happening at the rule engine uh, side of it. Uh, on, on the workflow side, it's really just about how you manage that process over time. Dave, you want to expand on that at all or any comments there? Yeah, yeah I, I agree completely. I think in, in my mind the process is largely driven by the business uh, and how they uh, carry that out and what they feel they uniquely bring to the, uh, to the table. The interesting thing about rules is not all the rules are decided by the business. There, there can be uh, regulations that are imposed on a business that become rules. And so the rule maintenance cycle can be independent of the process. And I think even the way that they're represented, um, it, it's difficult to maintain business rules in something that looks like a process workflow. So I, I just, to me, they feel very different and need to be maintained differently. Yep. The other comment I'd make, just going back to the, the programming versus a business rules engine, is you know, we have a number of customers who implemented you know, years ago, uh, they implemented these legacy systems with code and where that decision is. And oftentimes, when you have to go change that, let's say it's you know two years later and you're making that change, the 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 programmers and coders don't even know where it is. I, I mean, it's down in it's spaghetti code down in there somewhere. And and how would you possibly find that, make that to make that change? And then what are the ramifications to it? It it's really it's just abstracting that information up to a business tool 
that provides both an audit trail and a trackability, but also an easy way to, to adjust that. You know, I think that's what the rules engine really brings to the brings to the party there. So, uh, with with that, I think that's that's it for for questions and and timing here. So, again, I would like to thank everyone for attending today, and hopefully you've you've learned some good information. And we have contact information up there. Uh, please feel free to contact either Corticon or Blue Slate if you're interested in. Uh, both automating your business processes and then accelerating them with, with business rules. So thank you again for attending today, and uh, have a great day.